So I will come back to the, um, the discussion and the, the narrative of what I wanted to bring to the table, which is diversity is power. Everybody brings and fits that puzzle to make it a whole. Diverse groups of problem solvers consistently will outperform groups of the best and the brightest, and that's on every single level. Diversity encourages creativity, and simply being exposed to diversity can change the way you think. Um, dissenting opinions are better to receive. So opinions actually, which we haven't realized, which are sometimes given from somebody who is different from your own cultural group or background are often better received because it causes people to start to listen, not to think it's just somebody like me that's talking again. Diversity encourages problem solving. So it's a blend of different experiences and information um, being similar to others leads us to hold and process the same information. We need to get somebody else's mind viewpoint on the table to really make that change. And if we look at this Princeton University a publication, there was somebody that looked and, and actually did a, a, a mathematical proof because at that time it was thought that different people actually mixed up the, um, mixed up the culture and didn't make it operate as efficiently. But actually, diversity trumps homogeneity and it, diversity also trumps ability. So even when you've got the best and the brightest, but they brought it down to four different sort of areas. So if the problem is difficult, you can definitely, um, um, definitely need more homogeneous people around the table. The calculus condition, as in everybody must be smart, so have some ability to solve the problem. And that's, you know, anybody who's in medicine, anybody who's working in the medical field nurses, so forth, that means everybody's, you know, has a basic level of smartness. And the diversity condition, there must be diversity amongst the problem solvers. And the size matters. The group has to be more than a handful and to be drawn from a large population. So therefore it draws us to think, who are our people that solve our everyday problems in medicine? Is it a handful at the top or do we have the numbers? Do we have the diversity? That's why some of the problems remain difficult because we have not got everybody around the table. The other thing is actually looking about diverse teams. So we're thinking about publications, exciting stuff. Diverse teams have been shown to build a better product when judged by their peers. So if we're looking at academia, they look at 1.5 minute academic papers. It's fantastic. Written up in Scientific American, they found that diverse groups received more citations and had higher impact factors than people written by the same ethnic group. But it's also re recognized that homogeneous authors may still make up more, far more than the fair share of the papers. But the study found that per persons of similar ethnicity, when they co-author together more frequently, um, sorry, they basically they um, co-author together, not surprisingly, more frequently than predicted by their proportion amongst authors. And so it's, essentially this suggests that we can get work, um, we can get things done when we work across boundaries but we've got to make an effort to reach across those boundaries because it's very easy just to go with the norms, the same echo chambers, the same viewpoints. Staff diversity is important. So again, when we're coming back to think about clinical medicine, leaders, chairs and non-exec directors are not representative of the communities they govern and we recognise that and then we're increasingly trying to do something about it. But we should also know that diverse workforce is linked to good patient care and better outcomes. Also, we know that when trust commission services, they fail to um, cater for BAME groups. And we know that, so black and brown groups are not necessarily um, thought about because those that are commissioning the services don't have that viewpoint. A diversity climate leads to positive work outcomes, improved performance, decreased absenteeism, greater customer um, satisfaction. So win-win all around. So again here, diverse thinking styles, 66% more innovation, if you've got inclusive leaders, you have a higher likelihood of capturing your market, more market share growth, and more employee engagement. And if you look at the Fortune 500 companies, and that's by the valuation of the companies, they have more diverse leadership. So Matthew Syed, sorry, that's a bit blurred, is one of my go-to authors. I highly recommend his book, Rebel Ideas. And I found this fantastic um, sort of synopsis on Pinterest. Um, which sometimes I'm looking at for all my home stuff, but on Pinterest, um, and which really um, kind of summarised what Rebel Ideas was about. And for those of you who haven't heard of it, he essentially started to dissect and work out why 9-11 happened when you had fantastic Harvard graduates 
who had this intel and information but didn't use it. And the long and short of it is because it was the sameness. They couldn't see that the, um, the um, Muslim man in the hills reciting poetry was a call to arms. They couldn't see that. They just thought he was a madman just waffling on with no um, um, power because they didn't have that um, the viewpoint. They thought they didn't want to get outsiders in because it would uh, dilute um, the FBI um, and they wanted it to be white American. They thought it would be harmful to the FBI in American values, not actually realizing that there are Americans who are not white, who are, uh, have American values that would have enhanced their system. We want to ensure that we are better and smarter because of the diversity that we share. We listen, we're curious, we explore, we get rid of our um, research naivety. Um, we get idea flows, horizontal flows, social networks that intersperse, that fuse, that we have insights. We have recombinant innovation, which I love, which is two um, sort of ideas, um, although they put their two ideas having sex, which is a, a funny way to think of it. But if you're thinking about it, even from um, the way that reproduction occurs, if you get two different systems, it's thinking about the manufacturing system, or shall I give you the example of the, um, the um, so the aeroplane sort of system, do you remember with human factors, that came with the fusion with medicine, two different um, areas and gave us our lovely simulation human factors that we have now. And you get that when you have diversity, you get rid of that dominance dynamic of one particular group. And rather than just having clones of people sitting within one group, you get the um, cognitive diversity, that changing of thought. You get an emergent system which produces excellence um, and produces balance that produces love, produces openness, inclusiveness, and a good perspective, which is where humanity should be. I also want you to have a look at diversity in terms of all aspects. So some people will be thinking, yeah, what about gender and age? Can you see the, um, the change and the difference? So even if you're thinking that actually, yeah, it's not that much of it, it's a 10% increase in productivity and innovation just by increasing your diversity. Imagine the difference that can make to the incomes and the, um, sorry, the outcomes um, of where you work, to patient care, a 10% change. Um, in just a 10% change within the NHS would help to um, even solve some of the income generation problems also. And that's why we have the cost of lack of inclusion. We saw that. We had the excess deaths with COVID-19. That's when it started to be laid bare. And as Gita really kindly illustrated, we realized we didn't have true ethnicity data from um, death certs. Um, we understood that discrimination led to poor patient experience and also mistrust and fear with delayed um, um, presentation. So the increased morbidity and resultant costs to the system were huge because it then has a huge cost to us as the NHS and society and becomes this eternal cycle of failure where we're really trying to get the NHS where it should be and really producing the world standards and world-class care that it can. It should be the health of the nature, nation, the mantra of the NHS, prevention of illness and disease. Where are we in that? Where do we start off in that? So it's a business case, I think, for us to be inclusive in our leadership. And to be inclusive um, leaders, we need to drive the way our organization grows in the 21st century. And it's, that's one of our biggest challenges in the NHS is how do we create growth despite our lack of resources and where we are. But to grow, you need to differentiate. To differentiate, you need to innovate. And to innovate, you need diversity. And to activate the diversity, you need inclusion. So it's not good enough for us as a trust to have 40, 50% of people that are diverse. Are they included at the table? Are they allowed to um, get that membership, the support to get to the positions they need to be? And to manage all of this, you need inclusive leadership. So again, I was on my MBA um, talk yesterday and they were talking about culture and about people making sure that to have an inclusive culture, make sure everybody has access to the same um, um, abilities to grow. And everybody said, oh, yeah, that's fine. We were all allowed to apply to this MBA. And I just had to put a little caution into everybody we may have had all the same chance to apply to the MBA, but some of us have been mentored and we've been supported to grow such that we are able to actually get that MBA um, application or approval. Some of us haven't. So some people don't get the career support they need 
they don't get the mentorship or the life support they don't get the health support the financial support because um they are in a sense in the corner forgotten seen as people perhaps who are not as intelligent as other people who they want to push forward for talent management and it's really important for us to reflect on that on the people that are lost or forgotten in the race and so therefore i come back to cultural safety so think about cultural safety in the workplace and this is again um, you know, fantastic stuff that's been done, um, really looking at the Aboriginal um, people. Um, and a lot of the work actually comes out of New Zealand. And I think we have a, an Australia as well, a lot to learn from that. But New Zealand has got fantastic stuff in there. And really, I'm going to reframe this in the context of how we deliver um, um, postgraduate, undergraduate care as well. So really, you've got to, for you, in order for us to understand and address racism within postgraduate systems, undergraduate systems, it's really, really important to understand the perspective of the people who are in that system. It's not good enough for people to think they know. There are so many unknown unknowns because we don't have the stories. And this will be vital for the health of our whole system of the NHS. And when we're talking about systems, people often get, um, feel insulted by the term about institutional racism or systems that are structurally racist. And that's, we've got to understand that it's not an insult. What it is, it's just a, a reflection on understanding that systems are set up, um, you know, generations ago for the people that, assist, uh, that existed at that time. So even if we look at medicine, there are simple things such as guidelines that we have to reflect on do not fit our communities. For example, I will always go back to this. We have a nice guidance for um, maternal um, hypertension. That was changed a few years ago to make the first line um, drug, libetalol. Now, some of you who are on the call will know that for um, lots of women of black origin, calcium antagonists are better for them. But if that's the first line on the um, nice guidance, which has not really taken into account any ethnicity data or outcomes, it means that those women will have delayed care. Therefore, they're more likely to end up with things such as PT and so forth, and result of preterm delivery, knock-on effects on kidney issues, liver issues. And that's just one small example. Um, again, if we look at go on to three, one size healthcare does not fit all. It results in a system designed actually sometimes for the people that there exist. And people would have heard a lot of narrative around cystic fibrosis, lots of research in that in comparison to sickle cell. Now, we're really, really lucky. I think, you know, Imperial is a fantastic organisation. I love working here. We've got excellent clinicians who are very passionate about their care. And we deliver, I feel, you know, sickle cell care in an exemplary manner. Now, I met a woman on the ward that I hadn't recognised or realised, you know, sat down just to talk to her a little bit, that um, sickle cell people do not have um, medical exemption. So all the drugs, everything you prescribe, they pay for that. I have got, you know, low thyroid, I've got a medical exemption. Now that is a, a healthcare system which is not fit for purpose. So therefore in, in prescribing patterns and even in compliance patterns, sometimes people will not be compliant because of the a, a cost of um, that medication. I think we should do something about it anyway. If anybody's prepared to put up, do some sort of um, a petition, post that into the chat and we can take that up later. So again, it's also to recognize that if you've got a culturally safe system, not just health system, but um, an area of work, um, a mentorship scheme, um, it's more likely to be, to be used by those people. So think what is psychologically and culturally safe in the area that you work? And the only person that can determine whether or not that is safe is culturally safe are the people who use the system. So to, again, coming back to 10 benefits of workplace diversity, because I keep trying to come back to it for you to understand and really embed that within our minds, a variety of different perspectives, higher innovation, faster problem solving, better decision making, because it actually is faster problem solving. Um, within, if you've got a, you know, a critical uh, or a time issue within your department, related to health, related to system change, get everybody around the table because of the creativity, increased profits, reduced turnover because people are engaged, better reputation and improved hiring results because people will want to come to work with you and for you because of your reputation. So I'm gonna try and finish off by giving you some eight best practices for changing your culture and thinking about diversity and inclusion from this fantastic article I found. 
So first of all, establish a sense of belonging. So inclusion is not simply about a physical proximity, it's about intention. It's about planning for the success of all students. What can you do? What's your shared medical experience that you can give that actually you don't realize that that's a true nugget of power that you can give to somebody else on their own journey? What shared training can you have? What sort of appraisals can you have? What shared work-life balance can you have? And in not just presenting ourselves as this cold steel doctors, but actually somebody um, who, have a, who has a life outside, we then bring people onto our journey and let them recognize it's not simply about what you do at work, it's also how you develop as a person. You establish that sense of belonging of somebody that cares. Empathetic leadership is key. Diversity has been invited to the party, inclusion has been asked to dance. So it's again, I love this because we often talk about all these social things that we do at work where somebody says, okay, yeah, do you want to come? But it's not simply about coming to the pub and standing in the corner. It's actually deciding to engage with that person to really understand. And really, you know, one thing I'll say in my life, I've got another, I've got a few, few best friends, three best friends. Another one is from Croatia, it's her background. I may have not been to Croatia yet, but I love the Croatian waterfalls, the Croatian food and the Croatian way of living because I almost live it through her. Um, and that's her inclusion. She's included me in her life and I've been asked to dance and to enjoy those aspects of it. And that's the same in medicine. Um, and, and, and that's how you start to pull people in. You have that empathetic leadership. So you remember a time you talk to them about times when you yourself were excluded. It may not be around diversity, or it may not be around ethnicity, but we've all been there because we're all in medicine <laughs> and we know that there are bullies that exist. We've been undermined and we have to almost feel it within ourselves. And when you can identify that, that's the starting point. That's a critical point. So mentorship and coaching with an empathetic view, that's how people will come on board with you. Top-down approach isn't enough. It's not good enough for us to leave it all to, to um, you know, the trust board saying what's of June and Redhead doing or um, you know Tim it's also for us to drive commitment but with compliance what can we do we all have a responsibility we should all know that um, and I love this quote from Maya Angelou that diversity makes for a rich tapestry we must understand that all the threads of tapestry are equal in value no matter their colour but that means your voice is also equal and then the little bits that you do are also in, um, equal and we must do all we can to activate every part of the system, not simply from legislation that comes from NHS England down and res targets and indicators, but also us. Can you chair a value session? Can you say, actually, let's do a talk on diversity. Let's talk about what it means to us. There are so many tools out there that you can just pull together as education leads and sit down and begin a discussion and allow somebody to go on their own journey. Can you mentor or befriend or coach somebody? It doesn't have to be somebody who's a doctor. It could be a nurse. It could be an administrator. What value can you add? And core quotas don't automate inclusion. Inclusive leadership is not a destination. It's a journey that requires humility, curiosity, and courage. So the quotas won't necessarily mean that everybody's around the table, but we've got to start to adapt. Who's invited? Who gets to speak? Have you left anybody out that the input that would be valuable? You have to look at the lens of what you've created, your local environment. Have I created conditions where people can contribute in a unique, meaningful way, where they feel safe, secure? And if that's not the case, we've got to have the courage to admit that and start to change it. Who gets access to the audits, the quits and the research? Look at your department. Who, who are the people who are actually doing all the research projects? Do you have the diversity there? And that's a, a really good place to start. Inclusion is ongoing, so it's not one-off training. Why has it taken us a world pandemic for us to realize that this was a problem? How do we keep the change going? So that I'm gonna ask you this at the end of, the, of this session. So please put those that into the chat. So diversity is mixed, inclusion is making the mix work. Really, really important, really important. I was gonna put an, put an analogy with a cake, but I thought that might be too cheesy, so I won't go there. And then maximise the joy and the connection and minimise the fear. You know, value diversity, love and broaden your life. Embrace the differences. I love seeing differences from around the world. As I said, it allows us to travel and see areas we would never experience otherwise because we experience them through other people's narratives, through their stories. Our minds are richer. Our experiences are richer. Our knowledge and application is richer. Um, my um, best friend, as I said, is from New Zealand, but actually she's from a British family and tradition. So I'm very close also to her mother. 
who's older and she um, taught in um, the Middle East and actually connected with some people from that area who give them little stories about their villages. Um, and she loves telling those stories. And now is watching a lovely series on Netflix, which is bringing it all to life. And although she's older and she's been in the middle of this pandemic, these are things that have really allowed her um, to really connect and enjoy the world. Um, and it was really important to recognize that. And then forget fit. It's not about fit and looking necessarily, because there's, there's, there is a, definitely a thought about your culture and getting your team to fit together. And there's a certain element about, of it. But if you focus on helping the individual, individual thrive within your team, it's um, more important. It will define your department. So the norms, the power structures, the inequities in society, they can be embedded in an organization. We're thinking what's the imperial fit or the fit for this consultant body or the, um, the doctors that you want to do a particular project. But fit can be dangerous because it can exclude. You've got to be able to first identify and bring your organizational values, mission and purpose and define it um, and, and define what fit is. So it adheres to those. You've got to define it differently. Take it back a step and then consider your brand and your culture. What do they say about your department? What do we say about Imperial? Is it one size fits all? Is it the place where it's really much um, the snowy white peaks with a, you know, as you get further up, there's lots of white people in charge? Or are we really that people that really understand the deep culture? I, um, I'm bringing back, you back to the cultural iceberg that we talked about at the beginning. So it's not just about the festivals, the foods, the flags, the music, the games, the language. It's about those things deeper. It's about courtesy manners, it's about attitudes, approaches, concepts, communication styles and rules. Understand the people that you are merging with. We have, and I love this, and I love it because Jimmy Carter said it. <laughs> and that's why I love it all the more. Um, and this is where you really have to understand that when it comes to diversity and inclusivity, it's not necessarily about the white allies, I would say, um, it's about all of us. It's not thinking that as a black person that will need to talk about diversity or white person that needs to talk about white allyship. We are all in this together because we are not a melting pot, but we are a beautiful mosaic, different people, different beliefs, different yearnings, different hopes, different dreams. We are a beautiful mosaic.